for joining us for PLG TV's live debates. I'm Matt Gordon. Tonight we will, we will be debating the state representatives for the 50th district. It is a rematch of two years ago. We have the Democratic candidate, James DeWeese, versus the Republican candidate, Chad McCoy. Thank you both for showing up tonight, as you did two years ago on this very same stage. Uh, we are excited about this evening. It is a 60-minute debate, so we have a lot of questions and a lot of topics to get through. That brings me to the two gentlemen, to my right to my left, who will be asking the questions this evening. To my left is Forrest Berkshire, the editor of the Kentucky Standard. To my right is reporter of the Kentucky Standard, Randy Patrick. And to the right of Randy is our timekeeper, Scott Cedarholm, who will be keeping our time. We would like to thank our main sponsor this evening, which is Wilson & Mir Bank. We'd also like to thank Lee's Famous Recipe for feeding our crew this evening. And uh, we will start with opening statements, which you both will have two minutes apiece to go through. After that, we will go into our questions. And winning the coin toss in the back was Democratic candidate James DeWeese. So you will be starting off our opening statements. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the Kentucky Standard and PLG for organizing tonight's events. Uh, and also uh, our sponsors, Wilson Muir Bank and Lee's Chicken for tonight's forum. Uh, hello, Nelson County. My name is James DeWeese and I'm running to be your state representative. Uh, I'm running to be your state representative because I want to help make government work for working families. A little bit about myself. I'm married to my wife, Christy, who's sitting out here in the audience and we've been married for about 10 years and she's a lifelong resident out here in Nelson County. We felt this was the best place to bring up our children. I have a, a daughter, Sydney, who's eight years old and a son, Mason, who's five. And they're very happy tonight because we got them babysitters and they're able to ride their bikes. <laughs> so they're not having to hear politics with dad tonight. So they're, uh, they're very, very happy. My, my daughter goes over to Foster Heights Elementary School and my son is uh, in preschool at the Early Learning Center. So as you can see, that's why public education is very important to us. Uh, currently work at Teamsters Local 89 as a business agent, and I represent people at UPS, uh, the workers at UPS. And I've been an advocate for working families since I've been about 18 or 19 years old. So essentially my whole adult life, I've been advocating for good wages, affordable health care, retirement security, safe workplaces, safe environments. And that's really what I'd like to do as well as your state representative there in Frankfurt. Um, as your state representative, I'll stand up for Nelson County and against the attacks on working families and educators that they have faced in the past two years. In the past two years, we have seen attacks against the paychecks of working families with the, prevail, uh, the repeal of prevailing wages and the right to work laws. We've seen a, a tax against the pensions of our teachers and public workers, a tax on our public education system, a tax on the pocketbooks of working families through an unfair tax increases that only favor the wealthy and burden small businesses. We've also seen bills passed where many legislators were not allowed time to read the bills. I ask for your vote November 6th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dweez. Mr. McCoy. Thanks, sir. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks to everybody in attendance for coming out. Um, I'm sure you had a lot of choices for what to do tonight, but we're glad you're here. This is the kind of thing, you know, government needs to do this so that we can get past some of the devi divisiveness, that's a hard word to say, that's out there. Very quickly, I'm Chad McCoy. I'm finishing my first term as your state representative. Um, never done politics in my life. I work for myself. I'm an attorney here in town. I don't work for a special interest, a special interest group, or any big organization that's got a stake in this game. I'm out there for Nelson County. I've lived here since 2004, married to my lovely wife, Dr. Holly McCoy, who's here with me. This is our 25th year of marriage, and we have two kids that have gone off to college. And, and like James's kids, they are so glad they're not here tonight. Uh, they've been glad to miss this entire campaign season because I made them knock doors with me last year or two years ago. And I get a Snapchat from them about every day when they see me out knocking going, oh, I'm so glad I'm not in Nelson County right now. So they're enjoying, they're enjoying college. Um, it's been an exciting two years. 
and and it's been a two years filled with change and change is scary i get it change makes everybody nervous but i hope people will pay attention that the good things that have come from this change for example we have record low unemployment in the whole state lowest it's been in over 40 years record investment in kentucky prior to the republicans taking over two years ago the largest investment in Kentucky was 1.5 billion. We've had nine and a half billion in the last two years. Record number of people back to work and off the labor force. 56,000 people lifted up out of poverty. Highest ever per pupil funding of the SEEK formula. We've had pensions fully funded for the first time in 10 years. We've had income taxes lowered for every working family out there and wages are up 5% in Nelson County. So, I'll leave it at that and see the stop sign. All right. We want to be sure that, uh, to let you guys know that you will have more time for your closing statements to uh, finish anything that was unsaid. Uh, but right now, we would like to move into our questions. Uh, you will have three minutes to answer the questions, and then you will have the opportunity to rebuttal if you'd like. We would like you to keep the rebuttals down to about one minute. All right, and now to the questions. Where's uh, I'd like to thank you both for uh, participating tonight and, and showing up here uh, to answer these questions and for putting yourselves out there and knocking on these doors and all the effort that it takes. Thank you. Uh, this question is going to go first to uh, first to Chad and then it'll go to James. Um, so Chad, first to you. Uh, two big issues from the last session that are likely to carry over into, into next year is the pension reform and taxes. With this answer, could you please describe your stance on Kentucky's pension situation. So the pension situation is dire. Um, I don't know if you guys even saw today in the, in the Kentucky Herald Leader uh, an article. Yeah, we're getting double feedback there. Um, the reality is this: for a multitude of reasons, yes, the government was at fault for part of this, and yes, so were all the pension boards at fault for part of this. And yes, the people involved who weren't keeping up with the pension boards were involved in part of this. But the reality is the pension is underfunded by billions and billions and billions of dollars. And, and sometimes people use that as an argument for, because you can't give the exact number, maybe we don't really know what's going on. We know it's a range and it's a horrible range. So what we've tried to do is maintain the status quo for everybody who's in the pension system now. And then for folks that are going to come in, there's going to have to be a change. And what we, what we focused on was giving them some sort of guaranteed amount. It's not a 401k plan. It's a defined contribution plan. I mean, it's part of the defined benefit plans, excuse me. And it's a really good plan. And in fact, when you really stop and look at it, even the teachers, the JCTA said, yeah, we're not going to have trouble recruiting new teachers with this. This is a good new thing. So. The current situation is up in the air. There's been a lawsuit over it. One judge has ruled it unconstitutional. It's going to be decided by the Supremes. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I hope it stays in place because we've committed massive amounts of funding to it. I mean, we've got $4.5 billion. That's 15% of the state's budget right now going to fix the pension problem. And we've committed to do that over the next 20, 30 years. One way to think about what we did was we, we literally refinanced it but without it being an adjustable payment it's now a flat payment just like your home mortgage is and what had been happening up to this time is the debt was getting refinanced every year and if you go into refinance debt every year you never catch up and that's why our hole was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger so it's a huge chunk it's a huge chunk 15 percent of our budget it'll be like 20 percent of the budget next year but we've got to do something to fix the problem or otherwise, and I hope people understand this, and this is coming from everybody on both sides of it when we sit down and have a nice talk about it, the counties in the state are not gonna go bankrupt. It's just that there won't be money for the checks. So we've got to do something to protect the people that have a pension. Thank you, and now uh, James, if you could, um, would you like to, for me to repeat the question? Sure, go ahead. <clears throat> Two big issues uh, from last session that are, are likely to carry over into next year is pension reform and taxes. Mm -hmm. With this answer, could you please describe your stance on Kentucky's pension situation? The pension situation, of course, it's in court right now. Uh, hard to say what's going to happen there. This most likely could be coming back up in the next session. 
Uh, the pension issue is I am an advocate for a defined benefit plan. And I don't think that the legislators, le legislature should have moved to what they had done, particularly with the cash hybrid plan. Uh, Bevin really made this more of an emergency than what it was. The pension plan itself uh, earns typically about 8%, and they had moved that down and to make this an emergency situation. Here's what the pension fund needs. It needs funding, of course, right? Uh, but the legislature should have done some other things to bring in some new funding. Should have legalized gambling, and they should have legalized marijuana, and looked at those approaches before moving to this. Now, with what my opponent has said about the JCTA saying they won't have trouble attracting to, uh, new teachers, at the doors I'm hearing something completely different. I'm hearing a lot of people talk about how their children are in college to become teachers. Now they're moving away from that field. There's a constant attack on it. Uh, we will have problems bringing in new teachers, uh, coupled with the charter schools that, uh, that's looking to be brought in. And in addition, uh, with our pensions uh, for new teachers being under attack, yeah, we're going to have problems. And then we don't know what the legislature is going to do anyway uh, if they have a full majority here to do what they want in this next session. We'll move on to the next question. <coughs> okay, and this is concerning the other big issue that's likely to carry over into the next session. Uh, Kentucky's income tax was simplified and cut, but at least one study claims that 95% of Kentuckians will pay more because of the taxes uh, placed on several services, uh, like admissions to swimming pools, campgrounds, auto repairs. Is this really a tax cut? How can Kentucky grow its tax revenue in a fair way? And I'd like uh, Mr. DeWeese to answer the question first, please. Thank you, thank you for that question. The uh, tax shift is, is really what has occurred. Working families making about $175,000 or less has received an, a tax increase. And, uh, and those making a, uh, over $175,000 now have a, have a tax decrease. And it's lopsided and it's unfair. And what they've done is they've lowered the tax rate a hair uh, but in addition to that, we've lost serious deductions, uh, deductions on property. Uh, the master settlement tax, which affects our, prop, uh, our farmers, have now lost that deduction. And we've increased uh, a 6% service tax on numerous services. And so this, this equates to a large increase or an increase on working families. And, and I disagree with that. We, you know, we should be closing the loopholes for the wealthy and not putting this burden on working families. Thank you. Okay. And then Representative McCoy. Thanks, sir. Um, with all due respect, I completely disagree with that in simple math. The, the old tax system, the way it worked is if you were making 150% less, and, and let's keep in mind two concepts, okay? There's the concept of gross income, and taxable income. So first of all, when we talk about gross income, if you're truly a poor person, you didn't pay taxes before. 150% of the income poverty level, no tax, that's the same, it hasn't changed. When we move over to taxable income, what we found under the old system was everybody, rich or poor, paid 2% of the first thousand, 3% of the next thousand, 4% of the next thousand, 5% of the next thousand, then 6% of everything above that. Average wage in Nelson County, somewhere between 30 and 40,000. Every single one of those people got a tax break. Their income taxes went from 6% to 5%. That's a 17% reduction in income taxes. Now, go back 20 years. Kentucky's had a blue million of these blue ribbon commissions on tax reform. And the most recent one, the Democratic Governor Steve Bashir did, came back and said, okay, Kentucky, for you guys to get competitive in the world, You've got to do two things. Number one, you've got to lower your income tax. And number two, you've got to expand the sales tax base. What does that mean? It means start taxing other things that haven't been taxed already, like certain services. Now, why would you need to do that? All right, look to your north. Indiana, 3.5 income tax, 3% sales tax. Look to your south. 0% income tax in Tennessee, 9% sales tax. Tennessee has less poverty than we do less people on the dole than we do. Having a consumption-based tax has been shown to help everybody and it increases investment. And if we can in keep increasing investment like we have already done the last two years, 
everybody's incomes are going to rise, the state coffers are going to rise, and then what we're going to be able to do is reduce that income tax even further down. Our goal, and I think we did step one of what I'm going to say is four steps on tax reform. And I, and I want you to go out and kind of look at all the other states. North Carolina, Florida have all done this. But Kansas tried to do this, and they did it wrong. Kansas went to a straight consumption tax and cut off the income tax. And when they did that, they almost went bankrupt. Because what you don't understand about a sales tax is it requires new machinery, new software. You've got to have businesses that are capable of doing the accounts and all that. And it takes a while for the money to come in. So what we did this first year was we looked at services that already had the sales tax capability. For example, you go to the barber shop and you buy a can of mousse or hair gel, they taxed you on that already because that was a product. Those businesses already have the ability to add sales tax to the services. So they made sense to be the very first ones to start. I think we're going to see income tax come down, sales tax base expand. Mr. Dewey's a uh, number of things to unpack there, but in my opinion, the services that were that face this tax were the ones with the least lobbyists up there in Frankfurt. Uh, in addition to this, in, a, in addition to this, when you look at the break-even point, this information comes from the, uh, 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 Kentucky, or the uh, Kentucky Center for Economic Policy, the break-even point on the 6% or on the reduction of 6% down to 5% is $23,000, okay? So that's the folks making $23,000, that's the people who make 11 or $12 an hour. They're actually the ones facing the largest of this tax increase, okay? And then when you factor in for the other for the other brackets, including those as well, when you put in the uh, the service tax and then the lack of deductions, there is a tax increase. And publication after publication across the, across the state has reported on this. And working families cannot afford the shift in taxes on them, particularly when you have the lowest 20% who faces a $95 increase, the second 20% with a $150 a year increase, the middle 20% with $189 increase, the fourth 20% a $225 increase, and then the next 15 a uh, $172 increase. When you get into the more wealthier folks, this is the people above 175,000 or more, 175,000 actually to 250,000, they now have a uh, tax reduction of $542. And then the top 1% of that 427,000 to 1 million bracket has a $5,679 uh, tax gain or tax reduction there. So, you know, it, it, is, it is unbalanced, it's wrong, and it's wrong for working families, and I'll stand against any taxation on over taxation on working families there is. Mr. McCoy. Thanks, sir. Just, just one quick point, because I want to be clear that everybody heard it. Everybody with a taxable income under 23000 got a tax break. I mean, everybody with an income over that, sorry, got a tax break. Period. If that's the break-even point, then that means everybody above it got reduced taxes. The good news is they then got that money in their pocket. And with a sales tax, you have the choice. You can choose whether or not you're going to buy certain products and be able to justify your consumption that way. Mr. Luis? I don't think having your car repaired is a choice. And this is typically the income bracket of folks who's not going to have a new car. And the car breaks down, it's going to be a tragedy to try to get that fixed. So that's not a choice. And, and neither is a number of these things that's been taxed. All right, we'll move on to the next question. And first, um, before I get to this question, I've heard a little bit of commotion behind me I'm on, I'm on my right side and on my left side. I would just remind our audience that um, to remain respectful of both the candidates, the people asking the questions, and the audience at home. Uh, this question is going to go to Chad uh, and, then, and then to Jane. Um, but Chad, college is becoming unaffordable for the middle class. It seems often the answer from politicians is that college isn't for everybody. Many of those saying that though already have a college degree. 
What can state government do to make college affordable for those who are seeking a higher education? You know, the, the, the issue with colleges and, and really comes down to a lot of funding. What are we funding and what cuts can be made? We do a huge disservice when we push that everybody ought to go to college. I think everybody should if you're interested in it. But when we send kids to college and they come out with a, and no offense to anybody who's got this degree, but if you're an art history major and you've got 100000 in debt and you're trying to figure out why your personal finances aren't working out right, that's why, you know? There are other things you can do. And so I really think we need to get the colleges efficient. I think they need to take a hard look at themselves and, and maybe there are programs that we don't need to be funding for people. You know, one of the big things that I've been working on, and you'll, you'll hear me blab on about it later, workforce development is huge. Um, we are actively working with the local school board right now in the chamber and businesses here to try to figure out what can we do to help kids get through high school, look at college if that's the way it is, look at a trade school if that's the best spot, but regardless, get themselves educated economically so that they're going to have a good job, they can raise a family on, you know, without having to incur all of that debt. So I think we've really got to work hard on the workforce development part of it but I would encourage colleges as well to keep on cutting and looking at ways to reduce it. And then you're back to funding, 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 funding. But guys, the state has been left trashed. We don't have enough money to do transportation or budget. We don't have enough money to do, I mean, look what happened with the Stephen Foster story. For years, we've just been ignoring things in Frankfurt. We've been ignoring our roads. We've been ignoring our state parks. And there's just not enough money unless everybody wants to raise taxes which of course, nobody wants to raise taxes. So something's got to give there. And I think higher education is an area where they need to be more efficient. We need to make them look at what they're offering. And uh, Mr. DeWeese, college affordability. Well, that, it does come down to funding and I support the funding of education, public education and higher education. Uh, <coughs> college isn't for everybody though. And you know there are, there have been a, there's been a lot of talk, and then also some uh, strategies put in place for moving people into the trades. Uh, when you look at when you look at these trade skills that uh, that we lack here, and we do, and if there's not enough people going into the trades, that's something that we really need to promote throughout Kentucky, bringing people into the industrial maintenance programs, bringing them into the electrician programs, the uh, the plumbing programs. And the skilled trades, uh, the skilled trades unions actually have a lot of apprenticeship programs that we really need to partner and help pull people into these fields uh, because they, they need the workers and this is some of the best, uh, some, some of the best training programs there is. Uh, some, some, uh, some problems that you have with that though is recently the legislature has, has reduced the amount of requirements to go into those trades which reduces the quality of uh, the, the quality of skill sets that we have. And I think that we, that we are moving backwards in that component of it. But higher education, I, I do think that we need to fund it and, and put any funding where we can with it. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to the next question. All right, Chad, this one will be for you. <clears throat> Just last week, uh, authorities arrested a man who was planning a school shooting. Um, what has the legislature done to address the crisis of school mass shootings or mass shootings in general and what more should it do should firearms restrictions be part of the solution so what what has gone on and unfortunately with marshall county last year and representative will course he's a democrat great guy that that was his district uh he and bam carney really started trying to get committees together and there's, it's tough, you know, it's a tough issue. I'm certainly not somebody who's in favor of, of gun control and gun restrictions. I'm a, I'm a very pro Second Amendment person. But what do we do with our schools? And, and when you look at the mass shootings that occur, first of all, you guys know you're in the industry, they were overreported by some insane number, but nevertheless, they're here and we need to deal with them. I, I'm very much in favor of school officers, if we can get them but that comes back again to money. Um, I think a lot of this, we gotta look at society. Why are we having these school shootings? You know, I, I tell this story all the time. My grandfather used to go to, go to um, his school at Everman Creek up in Carter County. And he tells me they literally carried their guns to school and leaned them up against the wall in the classroom. 
and then after school they all went home and shot squirrels on the way home and whatever when i went to high school i had a shotgun in the back of my pickup truck it's not necessarily guns that are the problem we have some problem though and it's a societal problem that we need to get figured out and when you really step back and look at it we're lacking in a lot of mental health that we offer folks um, there's huge gains that we've made over the last two years there you've obviously got all the opioid issues that are tying into this whole thing so it, it, it's a tough issue but it is something that they are actively looking at I know the education committee randy has got um, they started like a, a sub work group if you will on school safety and then uh, Mr. Deweese, the, the same question, if you need me to repeat it, I can. No, no, I, 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 I received the question. So the I am a supporter of the Second Amendment, and I, I don't think that's the course that we need to take to uh, solve the school shootings that we have. It, but I do think that where we are lacking at and what we need to do is make sure that people have affordable health care, the affordable health care that they can use to get the help that they need before something like this occurs. And I disagree, we went backwards on this in this state. Uh, people need affordable health care to help solve the mental health crisis that we have going, going on in this country. Thank you. All right, well, before we continue, we got uh, Mr. McCoy, another microphone. Could you check the microphone just to be sure? Check, check, check. Okay, thanks. I want to make sure we can hear you without the static there. All right, we're going to move on to the uh, next question. And uh, I'll ask this question, Mr. Deweese. Both of you describe yourselves as pro-life, but what does that mean to you in terms of state law? And are there details on which you differ? Should abortion be legal in the case of rape or incest? What about the life of, of the mother? Is it, what about if the life of the mother is in danger? Well, the pro-life issue is a major issue, particularly in Nelson County. And I am 100% pro-life, and I'm also against the death, death penalty as well. Uh, you know, my wife and I, we faced a very, very hard situation once uh, when my son was being born and my wife had a serious complication with the child in which that we were told that the child, it would be winning the lottery if the child is born, or if the, if, if the child is born. If the child was born, then most likely the child would have severe deformity and probably wouldn't have a very long life. We chose to have our child because that's what, you know, what, what we believe. And I have a very happy, healthy child. So that is our personal, personal uh, position on that, my wife and I, and, uh, and we are 100% pro-life. Thank you. Now, uh, Representative McCoy. Thank you, sir. Um, I am, again, 100% pro-life. I have voted for the pro-life bills that are up there. And, and honestly, on the, on the pro-life, when you look at that spectrum, not only is that the abortion issue, but I've also been the primary sponsor last year and this year of the death penalty, anti-death penalty bill, and was able to get a hearing on the death penalty um, this past July. I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to actually um, get that onto the floor this year. That's kind of my goal. If I get back up to Frankfurt, I want to have the death penalty. And, and we can talk about all the moral reasons. We can talk about all the reasons not to, but there are economic reasons. The death penalty doesn't make sense for this state. And so for me, it's a pro-life issue um, as well as the, the abortion issues. Mr. DeWeese, you had a rebuttal? In addition to being pro-life, we need to also talk about other things to help with the abortion issue. One is making sure that people have equal pay, women have equal pay, and also that the maternity clock doesn't conflict with the career clock, and also that families have affordable health care and the, uh, the necessities that they need for a stable family, and making sure that families have a good income and good jobs to have so they can sustain themselves. So there's a lot more to that component as well that I support, making sure uh, real, real, uh, real real items to help help with the abortion issue thank you <laughs> all right we'll move on to the next question all right we're going to uh, switch to uh, environment and energy uh, and um, mr uh, mccoy if you'll go first on this one uh governor matt bevan earlier this month asked if we sit on 100 years worth of supply 
why would we not do everything in our power to subsidize that process? He said cheap electricity attracts more businesses to our state, but coal is also a dirty source of energy. Should the state be encouraging coal power production when scientists agree that carbon emissions contribute significantly to climate change? Do you believe that human activities have contributed to climate change? And do you think action can be taken at the state government level to reduce carbon emissions? So on, on the coal issue, coal has, has truly driven Kentucky's economy for so, so, so long. And as somebody that grew up in Eastern Kentucky, I can attest to that, but unfortunately, it really made itself the only game in town. And I think we've done a real disservice to the folks that live in Eastern Kentucky by not having other <coughs> industries in there, not bringing in better jobs, not having them better educated. And so we've got a real pickle right now because I think we need to move away from coal. Uh, it, you know, people can debate which side of it, but the science seems pretty clear that coal causes pollution, pollution causes global warming. and I. You know, we have got so many other alternatives out there that we can start looking at. You know, solar being one of them. You're seeing solar plants pop up. If you drive up I-64 now, you know, there's two or three of them as you go up through there. So we've got to start moving away from it, but I don't think we can do it by ripping the Band-Aid off and leaving Eastern Kentucky behind. So to me, that's the challenge is how do we transition those folks from those jobs that they were so dependent upon to something that's more sustainable, not only for them and their families, but for us in the environment. Thank you. And now, Mr. DeWeese, if you'll ask the question. Well, you know, when, when we asked the, uh, the coal companies to produce electricity for us a long time ago, they, they met the demands that we need to allow our country to prosper uh, the way it has. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, though, it is a dying industry, and, it, and we need to be there to help these green technologies uh, to not only get the foothold, but also to excel. So that way everyday Americans can afford uh, this technology to equip it to their house, particularly with solar, uh, solar power uh, uh, devices. And we need to look at better initiatives for wind as well and hydro. So I do support green technologies. The other question you had, do I believe that, uh, that humans increase, uh, what was it, pollution or, or uh, climate change. It, climate change. It, humans contribute to climate change. I, I do believe that. We have a lot of activity here on Earth, and I, and I do feel that it has a, has a, an effect on it. You know, and our scientists around the globe uh, keep reporting on this, and we are seeing the ice melt pretty quick up there. All right, thank you. We'll move on to the next question. And uh, we're going to stay on the topic of energy resources for one more question here. Yeah. Um, Mr. DeWeese, to you first. Um, a net metering bill nearly passed last session that industry ex experts say would have hurt the adoption of residential solar panels. Mm -hmm. It is likely to come up again next year. Do you support this legislation that would reduce the amount homeowners with solar panels can sell back to the utility companies? Should the state promote the use of renewable energy sources? Well, we should, we should uh, promote it in any way we can, but, uh, but I'm against that net, uh, the net metering bill. Uh, you know, you know, it, it, it was a get grab from the industries. And uh, Representative McCoy. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm on record. I voted against that bill. Actually, fought actively against the net metering bill, um, especially in conjunction with the Sisters of Charity here in town. We worked a lot on it. You know, there there is a point to be made there for the electric company that that maybe there is some cost shifting that can occur but we can't do it in the way they were doing it. We can't do it at the expense of getting rid of solar. And so there's a middle ground, and I think a lot of the folks that are studying the issue see that maybe we can make some move, but I was absolutely against the net metering. We've got to support the green technologies. And Mr. Sorry, go ahead. Just, just very quickly, uh, for the record, I may have been the only Republican against it. <laughs> there, there were not a lot on, uh, with the R that were on the board the way I voted. All right, Mr. Dweez, you had a rebuttal. I remember when I, when I was a, uh, a teenager, my father was working at Louisville Gas and Electric, uh, and I remember when the deregulation of the ener energy markets happened, and we were promised uh, a lot of different technologies that we would be allowed to sell back to these electric companies, and, uh, and that hasn't really came about. 
with with that deregulation a long time ago. But but I do remember that years ago. We all thought that we that we would be equipping our treadmills and things of that such and and sell selling our electric vehicles. So so uh, so I'm against the net metering bill completely. <laughs> All right, we'll move on to the next question. Yeah. All right, just today, uh, suspected bombs, uh, first of all, let me, uh, Mr. Deweese, if you'll answer this one. Yes, sir. Uh, just today, suspected bombs were intercepted that were intended for former President Barack Obama, uh, philanthropist, philanthropist uh, George Soros, uh, U.S. Representative Maxine Waters, and others who have been criticized by political conservative activists. Earlier this month, Senator Mitch McConnell was accosted in a restaurant while eating with his wife, state politics has become nearly as caustic as federal politics. What can you do, what will you do to return some sort of civility to our public debate? Do you think the heated political rhetoric of recent years is a danger to our democracy? I do think it is, and I think we're doing the right thing by doing it this way right here in front of an audience in which having civil discourse. Um, I, I, I do take some issue with, with the amount of rhetoric that's going on in, in, this, uh, in our country. I, I don't see as much going on in the state, but a lot of these issues are typically federal issues people are, are uh, arguing about the most. But, you know, we have to remind ourselves that our children are watching this. And we have, we have to uphold ourselves as, as politicians and as candidates uh, to, the, to the highest degree possible. Thank you. And uh, Representative McCoy, if you want to ask the question. Yeah, absolutely. So let me tell you what I've done. Um, number one, I've continued the coffee forums that Dave Floyd started. And I see a lot of faces out there that are for me and against me. And a lot of you have been at those coffee forums. I'm happy to talk to anybody anytime about it. Um, at my office in Frankfurt, you can call and come visit me anytime you want. You will get an appointment. I screen nobody. I meet with everybody. I'm happy to do it. And third and finally, I'm somebody that reaches across the aisle all the time. I have really good friends that I work with in Frankfurt that are Democrats. And we get together and we work on bills together. The, the divisiveness in this country is a poison. It is absolutely killing us. It has become tribal. My very first coffee, and I understand there are union members here that are mad at me for my vote on right to work. The ones that will come and talk to me, I'll explain it. It's not that I'm against them or against their position. I just had a different view. And yet, I walked into a room in Boston where people were standing up and screaming at me. The first week I was in the Capitol, I had to have an armed guard to go to the bathroom because people were there. Just recently with the, the teachers, there's a Remember November sign out there. That group was so mad at us. And yet, when I would go talk to them, some of them couldn't even explain to me why. And so this tribalness where we don't stop and just talk, it's fine to disagree, but but understand that there is a different position, there is a different side, and that goes for both sides. They need to start to understand that. So we, we've got to get past it. I, I, I blame the media. Sorry, guys. <laughs> you know, there, there is, I, I use this as an example. We did a ton of great stuff last year to help kids. A ton. I never got asked about it once. Instead, all I get asked about is something that's going to create a headline, something that's going to show divisiveness, not the things where, and go look, go look last year. At the, at the General Assembly, literally, I, I'm willing to bet you 90% of the laws passed, passed 98 to nothing. We all came together, worked together, and did good for the Commonwealth. It's only where there's a fight that anybody wants to make it news. And I think that's part of the problem. When all you see is people fighting and not the fact that people can get along and accomplish good things, it leads us to where we've got. Mr. Deweese, you had a rebuttal? Yes, so uh, our former representative, David Floyd, started those coffee hours. I don't know if they happened prior to him. Uh, it was a great idea. Uh, our representative continued with that, and if I'm elected, I'll continue those things as well. I'll meet with anyone anywhere, uh, because we have to have that type of dialogue and we have to understand the issues. And I'm a very hands-on person. I've been representing people since I've been 18 years old. I know that you have to listen. You have to listen to understand and not to respond. And that's where some, some of the people fail at. But, you know, the issues that happened in Frankfurt with the teachers 
and the labor force being upset over right to work uh, was simple protest. There was no, no violence that occurred there. There was no threats that was out there. It was simply people voicing their issues and what had happened. And that is healthy. And it's healthy for our democracy. Protest is good when it's done civilly and without violence. All right, thank you. We'll move on to the next question. Uh, this is uh, for Representative McCoy first. Last year, my old Kentucky home state park came close to losing the Stephen Foster story, and funding for other state parks is in jeopardy. What should a long-term strategy to, to provide adequate funding for state parks look like? So let me tell you what it should have looked like, and then we'll talk about what we're going to be able to do in the future. Everybody that owns something out there, you're familiar with the general concept of maintenance, and if you don't do it, things are going to break. I don't know why I wasn't up there, but we chose to spend our money on everything but maintenance for the state parks. And I'm talking the simple stuff. If there's a roof leak, fix the roof. Repaint it if it needs to be repainted. We let these properties get into such a horrible state of dis despair. I don't know what the word I'm looking for there is. It starts with a D. But at this point, we're really behind the curve. You know, that's what happened with the Stephen Foster story. An inspector goes out there and there's electric wires laying everywhere. People were going to get killed. The, the upstairs, if you've ever been down on that stage, it was not safe for anybody to go up. So now here we are because we didn't do maintenance. Now, rather than a $30 a month problem, we've got a half a million dollar problem. So state parks have to get, it, they have to start looking at themselves a little bit. How are they making money? Are they making money? Are they bringing any revenue? Do they need to start charging or not charging? Again, you come back to funding. You know, we're still at this funding, funding, funding issue. And listen, for the last 95 years, there's been one party in control. And what happened during those 95 years was crony capitalism. All the money that came into this state was going to people's buddies. And it wasn't going where it needed to go. And that's why we're in the boat we're in. Going forward, it's going to be tough because I don't know with the pension crisis that we have the extra money you know and that's going to be a problem so you see state parks trying to do things to make some extra money you see them offering more advertising you see them uh, you know offering beer where they can having more concerts that kind of stuff to bring themselves more into the commercial mainstream and i think i think that is a good option something that we could look at well, well, Mr. well the uh the remark of one party control for 95 years is not correct because we have had a balance within the different chambers during that time period uh, and and I'll, I'll reserve my remarks about our governor in that uh, but you know the Stephen Foster story is a true treasure that we have it's a tourism uh, it, it's it, it's it's a, a focal point of our tourism here it's a wonderful place to hold events our daughter has her dance competitions there every year we we love it we need we need to continue with the stephen foster story but it does have to be funded and when we build something we need to allocate the money to continue funding the maintenance of it you can't get behind on maintenance on anything because uh that's exactly what happens is that it builds up over time and you have a larger problem at hand Thank you. all right we'll move on to the next question and this one is uh, for Mr. Deweese first. Yes. Uh, Kentucky has one of the most unhealthy populations in the country. Mm -hmm. What should the legislature do to promote healthier lifestyles? Should an indoor smoking ban or bans on certain kinds of foods such as hamburgers and sodas in school be part of the solution? Well, for those that know me, know that if I get around cigarette smoke, the slightest whiff sends me into a rage of cough. And I've always been that way. Uh, I don't care for smoking at all. I don't want to be around it. But I don't think it. I don't think I should tell a business that they cannot have smoking. And I, and just just like myself, if they're you know I know a little store in another county that I, that I'm at occasionally, and they have people in there smoking. Guess what? I don't go there. And uh, and I always appreciate though the businesses who choose not to allow smoking. Um, but but smoke, you know, I took care of my grandfather for a year and a half when he's dying with lung cancer. I understand the uh, uh, the seriousness of, of smoking, but I don't see, I, I'm not going to be in favor of any type of smoking ban or anything like that. But, you know, moving forward with that, again, 
as I've said before, we need affordable health care. We need affordable health care to help people make better choices, affordable health care to give people the, uh, the tools and the medications uh, and the advocacy to become healthier. Thank you. And uh, Chad. Thanks, sir. Yeah, it, it's, uh, I'm, I'm kind of a libertarian Republican. I'm, I don't want the government telling me anything. And so I don't think it's the government's role to be telling any individual that they can smoke or not smoke or that a business they can have smoking or not smoking. I, I would push that down to local governments. I love it when it happens. <laughs> it's not to me because I, I like going to places where there isn't smoking. But I would hope that maybe we could vote with our dollars and you know we do have a business here in town that actually was not under the ban but chose to go smoke free in fact we've had two of them and i would encourage people to reward those businesses by going there and visiting them and showing them hey we appreciate you taking that step but but from the government standpoint you know what can we do for society kentucky it's just horrible the the smoking literally causes how Heiner came into this thing in our committee meeting and, and just showed us that at every single turn, at every single measurement, however you want to do it, smoking is a problem, overweight is a problem, the way we eat is a problem, the fructose that we ingest, the corn syrups, those processed foods, those are problems. Okay, but again, come back to me, government doesn't need to be telling somebody what to do, so what can you do? I like to try to find ways that we can make market forces incentivize people there. And one of the ways that we're actually doing it right now, if you're on the Kentucky um, state health care plan, number one, there's a website that you can go to to start doing some comparisons about different things and educate yourself. But maybe more importantly, this is the carrot versus the stick, there are rewards for you. If you show that you quit smoking, if you show that you're eating a better diet, if you show that you're not drinking your calories, which is something my doctor wife screams at every patient she has, don't drink your calories, then what you're going to get is reductions off of your co-pays. You're going to get reductions off of prescriptions when you go to the pharmacy. So we're giving folks the incentive that hopefully will allow them to make a choice that's good for them on a personal level and then ultimately will save the state a ton of money so good for all of us on that level. All right, we'll move on to the next question. Hi, I'm Representative uh, McCoy. This will, this will go to you first. Frankfurt passed a 50 cent per pack tax on cigarettes last session. Experts said it needed to be at least a dollar to reduce smoking rates. Do you think the 50 cents was enough? Would you support raising the tax if it meant that less young people would start smoking? The, you're right, the experts said it needs to be more. In fact, this is where you started getting into, okay, what's our goal? Because if we wanted to make smoking something that didn't happen at all, well, we could twenty dollars a pack tax you know so there becomes a level that what are you trying to accomplish with the government again I come back to you. it's not the government's role necessarily to be telling people to smoke or not smoke this was a tax that had a kind of a double benefit yeah we were going to get some people off off of smoking hopefully um, and it was also going to raise the revenue that was needed to cover the pension shortfall so it, it, it had two purposes there I'm not in favor of raising the cigarette tax anymore um, I would Again, I would love to see us find ways to incentivize people to stop smoking. It's addictive, we know it. The tobacco companies cheated, we know it. You know, there are lots of problems with that, and we need to figure out a way to help folks help themselves stop the smoking. Mr. DeWeese. Again, I do not like cigarettes at all. <laughs> but, uh, but, this is, but I'm against the tax on cigarettes because this is really a tax on the most vulnerable and the poor and the demographic of, uh, of folks in poverty tend to be the folks who smoke the most uh, within our society. Also, you know, we tax this to help with, with education and, and or the pensions and we, we put this tax on something that should be a fleeting tax. You know, that we, we should be working toward getting people away from smoking and I don't think taxing is going to do it again. This is where we need affordable health care. People have the ability to see to see doctors and to have somebody to help advocate and teach them how to be healthy. All right, we'll move on to the, uh, which will be the final question. 
Um, when we've interviewed county candidates, one of the biggest issues facing them is uh, overcrowded jails. And um, I know that's a, an issue at the state level too, uh, with prisons. Um, should the monetary level to qualify a crime as a felony, uh, a theft crime as a felony, be increased uh, in order to address the prison and jail overcrowding uh, problem, which is uh, related to the opioid epidemic? <clears throat> and are there other things also that the state might do, such as uh, decriminalizing marijuana so that those people are not uh, incarcerated for small amounts of marijuana? Uh, Chad, if you want to answer that question for me, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> the, the jail overcrowding is a huge, 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 huge problem. Right now, Kentucky incarcerates more of its citizens per capita than any other state in the union. It's ridiculous. Rather than address social problems over the years, we've just criminalized it. We're just going to put you in jail. And the biggest one, and you hit it, Randy, was, was the opioid addiction. We have people that have a problem. They have a disease. They're addicted to something and we're addressing it by sticking them in jail. What happens when you go to jail at age 20? You sit around with a bunch of criminals. What happens when you get out at 26? You've had a PhD in being a criminal. So you come out and, and all you've learned is how to be a better criminal. So we've got to do something to, to criminal justice reform is huge. And it's a bipartisan issue. I, I, I'm shocked by this, but the Republicans actually, we brought up two or three bills last year to help not only from the juvenile side, which they did back in like 2015, um, but at the adult level. And one of the big things was what you said, raising the level of a felony. Right now, because product prices have gone up, something that a few years ago, you know, you would have had to stolen a car almost to hit, now it can happen to you stealing makeup. Boom, and you're a, you're a felon. And I'm not trying to say that that justifies a stealing, but the problem you get, when you slap a felony on somebody's record, now how are you going to get a job? Now what are you gonna do? You know, we, we've trapped you into a cycle and the government shouldn't be doing that if we can help our citizens get out of this cycle. And if we just stop for a minute and decriminalize possession, for example, and stop putting those folks in jail, now we've got a revenue source. All that money that we're wasting on jails, hey, maybe we could spend that on rehab and getting these folks help. So it is, it is a really big issue. It also encompasses uh, probation and parole. You know, we've got a, a massive problem with folks that are in jail, then get out. How are we doing them on probation and parole? We're sending people back maybe when they don't need to be, when again, it's a drug issue and they need some help. There's lots of alternatives being looked at, but I'll just be honest with you. The problem is we sit up here and we have to say, I'm tough on crime, you know, because you'll vote us out of office. And the reality is that tough on crime mentality has not solved our problem, especially in Kentucky. It's made our problem horrible. So we need to be smart on crime. We need to figure out a way to stop the drugs, to stop the opioids from coming in here, cut them off at the source. We need to decriminalize some of the behaviors. But that doesn't mean that people just get a get out of free card. You know, we've got to do something else with it. Get them some help along the way. We're getting ready to lose an entire generation of young people. And I, it's really gonna be a problem for us as we get older, because these folks are dying, they're dying in the streets, and the ones that aren't dying in the streets are, are dying in the jails or learning even worse. So we need to fix it. Thank you, and James, if you can ask, uh, ask the same question. Yes, I think the opiate crisis is probably one of our most challenging issues that we have and the most important issue. The people that we have out here on the streets addicted to these opiates you know, we, we want to call them criminals. Really, there are family, there are friends, there are neighbors, people who have been over over prescribed medication, and then they move on to heroin and, and, and other drugs. Uh, but we have to really look at uh, the care that these people get when dealing with this issue. When, when you know, as a family, when, when you have a child who is struggling with heroin or opiates, do they have the affordable health care? Most time they don't. They don't have the insurance that they need to get the treatment that they need. And so they fall into the cycles of being arrested and being trapped in the system. Uh, we need to get these people real help. We need to make sure they have the affordable health care and the insurance to get the help that they need in these in the rehabs. We need more rehab facilities to help that. But another thing, I know we've talked about this before, is drug courts. Drug courts are very effective in getting people off of uh, uh, off the drugs and back into the system and we're not even bothering to fund these drug courts <clears throat> properly 
Uh, I am a supporter of legalizing marijuana. It was one of the toughest decisions I had because it was something I was formally against, but we have lost that war and we need to realize uh, that we should just tax it and, and, uh, and go at that a completely different route. But we have a lot of larger problems and that is the opiate crisis, people then moving into heroin and <clears throat> cocaine. And, uh, and that's a reality families are facing. You know, I had a really good friend a few years ago uh, whose mother lives out here in Nelson County and he was the last guy you'd ever think to get hooked on drugs and he was over prescribed some medication after a car accident. And then uh, after that addiction, moved on to heroin, lost his job. I was able to negotiate his job back and actually some treatment for the company he worked for. And they were gracious enough to help him out. But you know, later, later he died. But that's what our families are facing on a daily basis. And we have to give the families the resources to help their children to help their neighbors and to help their friends. And this is where we're falling short of folks. And as your state representative, that will be one of the biggest issues that I will be there to help tackle. Thank you. All right. Well, we'd like to thank you gentlemen for answering our questions. Now we're gonna move into our uh, closing statements, uh, which according to the coin toss, Mr. Dweez will be going last. Mm -hmm. So Mr. McCoy, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you all again for coming out tonight. I, I really appreciate it. And I hope you know if you have any questions after this, my office is up the street. Come see me. I'm glad to meet with you, talk to you about anything and everything. Let me just tell you about the last two years. Um, I've honestly, I've never done politics in my life and not even sure how I ended up sitting up here. But I have absolutely loved it. It has been one of the most exciting jobs I've ever done, most interesting jobs. And it takes a lot of work. Every 15 minutes, you've got folks coming in your office, and a lot of them are lobbyists, and they're all telling you that the sky is falling if you do X, the sky is falling if you don't do X. So I learned pretty quickly the sky is falling. Let's get over it and now be practical about what we're going to do. And you have to be up to speed on a ton of issues because you will go from net metering to the opioids to criminal justice reform literally in 45 minutes. And I say that because I want you to understand something. I genuinely work my butt off. You may not like where I end up, I get that. But I want you to understand, I don't come at it lightly, I study it, I think about it, I pray about it, and again, we may disagree at the end of the day, but I want you to know I truly am trying to do the right thing, not for myself, not for the company that I work for, but for you guys. This is a job interview. You're sitting out there looking to hire somebody, right? I mean, I'm your state rep. I've been hired by you to go up there and represent you. I don't vote with my party. I stand up against them. You can pull the tapes, you can pull the voting record. Much to their chagrin, I get on the floor and yell at them about things. Uh, I don't win awards from the chamber because I don't vote with my party. I vote for this county. And I think that's what you need is somebody who's not beholden to some other special interest group, but is there to work for everybody. Thank you. All right, thank you. And Mr. Dewey's. Well, I'd like to thank uh, you all and Nelson County for your time tonight uh, to talk about the issues that we have here in Nelson County and also in Frankfurt. Uh, as your state representative, I will stand up with working families and together we will make government work for you. I'll stand up for the paychecks of working families. I'll stand up for affordable health care. I'll stand up for our public education and our educators because a pension is a promise and our children deserve the best education that we can provide. I'll stand up for our public workers and all workers across the state. I'll stand up for real solutions for our growing drug epidemic. And I'll stand up for tax reform that helps working families and not harms our paychecks. I'll stand up for trans, uh, transparency, something that I don't feel that happened in, uh, in Frankfurt this time around. And I'll stand up against Matt Bevin. And I'll stand up for you. As your state representative, I look forward to working with you, and together we will make government work for working families. Thank you. And I ask for your vote respectfully, November 6th. 
All right. Well, we would like to thank both of you gentlemen. Uh, it was a very good debate, and uh, I do believe uh, people in the community have a very hard choice in, uh, in this race to come. Uh, we want to thank you for being civil, just like last time in the rematch. Uh, we want to thank you. We want to thank everybody at home for watching our debates this evening. We will be back again tomorrow night at 6 o'clock with the City Council debate. We would like to thank everybody here in attendance. We would like to thank Forrest Berkshire, Randy Patrick, Scott Cedarholm, Patrick Beam on the camera behind us, and the rest of our PLG and Kentucky Standard staff. We'd like to thank John White, the man behind the curtain, who's our producer this evening. And we would like to thank our main sponsor, which is Wilson Amir Bank. And then we would also like to thank Lee's Famous Recipe for our dinner this evening. My name is Matt Gordon. I'm with PLG, and we'll see you again tomorrow night.